Assalamu alaikum fam, hope you're doing well. So I wanted to share some great things that I have learned thus far in the book. I'm almost done with it. I wanted to share some of these great points I had with you. And this is Aqidah al-Tawheed, the Creed of Monotheism, Dr. Saleh al-Fazwan. And he's truly one of the great minds of our day, and I really appreciate him. So essentially, in section 2.1, essentially section 3, it's titled... The universe and its nature of submission and obedience to Allah. So what I learned in this section was, is that obedience is worship, right? So submission is worship, obedience is submission, and obedience is worship. And that we cannot disobey the commands of Allah, and that Allah set the order, and all creation follows it, and are bound by His will. And submission is an act of worship again. So, really made it full circle here for us. And then he gives some really cool points about the elements within our reality and how they all submit. And it was pretty cool. He contends, quote, The entire universe with its skies, its earths, its orbit, its planets and stars, its animals, trees... Axes, seas, angels, jinns, and mankind are submissive to Allah, obeying his universal command. So, here, I'm sure atheists like to mock, like, oh, physics. But it's at the same time, it's why does the physics not have to have a creator behind it, right? Why is it just these processes that can't have a cause behind it? It's, it's really quite strange how they go about it. But with these scholars, they give these very good Quran citations for their statements. And here is one for Quran 383. While to him submitted all creatures in the heavens and the earth willingly or unwillingly. So what I liked about that aspect is, is it makes you realize some things submit willingly or unwillingly. But either way, you're going to do what you have to do. You're going to submit even if you think you can resist, you can't, right? He also goes further, which is Quran 2, 116. Nay, to him belongs all that is in the heavens and on earth, and all surrender with obedience and worship to him. So here you see the example of obedience and worship to him. So surrendering, submission, aka with obedience, that's worship. So obedience is worship. Right? So you we're commanded to worship Allah alone. Our obedience is worshiping Him. And then there's another one here for us, Quran sixteen forty nine. And to Allah prostrate all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth, of the living moving creatures and the angels, and they are not proud, i.e. they worship their Lord Allah with humility. Quran sixteen forty nine. So the humility aspect brings into the willing part. Right, So the angels, they also can't disobey the will of Allah, but they also do it with eagerness and humility. They don't tire of singing praises to Allah, and they enjoy their position. Right. Further, there's a great point here, is that he gave a unique one for 2218, the Quran citation. It says, see you not. That to Allah prostrates whoever is in the heavens and whoever is on the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountains and the trees and ad dawab moving creature, beasts, etc. and many men. Quran twenty two eighteen. So the different elements, we seem prostration seems to be something we think of just the position we do in our prayer, in our salah, right? But each thing, entity, being in creation is going to worship in a way that befits them. So their form of prostration is going to be something different. But what I was thinking about is prostration is an act of going down, right? It's an act of like from upwards to downwards it's something like where you're under something and since Allah is the most high and nothing can go higher and we're all under Allah 
and and we're all bound for what Allah has to create upon us and you either submit willingly or unwillingly either way you're submitted that's your act of worship since your submission and obedience is worship and to prostrate is something very unique for each entity creature object on earth so this one was like very thought provoking when you begin to really think about how the ways are concerning prostration for other entities. There's also another Quran citation here for us, 1315. And to, oh sorry, and unto Allah alone falls in prostration, whoever is in the heavens and the earth, willingly or unwillingly, and so do their shadows in the mornings and in the afternoons. So the shadow part was pretty interesting because your shadow goes away and extends, right? At 12 o'clock, it's right above you, and you know, goes on, gets longer as the day goes by, and then goes away completely at night until you have the moon, which is really interesting if the moon is out, by the way. But the shadow element was like, hey, you know, you don't get to decide if your shadow appears or not. Your shadow is there. So very interesting point, right? Quite unique. Then the scholar gives us his insights. All these things and beings are subservient to Allah, subdued by his authority. They move in consonance with his will. So look at that. They move how his will depicts it. And this to me makes a lot of sense because it's like people say, well, how? It's like, well, his will is for it to go how it should go. And it's not as childish as some atheists try to make it sound out to be. It's his command. It's his will. And it'll do what it has to do. None of them disobeys him therein. They all fulfill their respective roles. So here... Again, everything in creation, fulfilling its respective role, right? So Allah puts it into command, it does its role how it's supposed to. And the result thereof, it's a precise order. So here, everything is set in order to the way it's supposed to be and how Allah wanted it to be. Which negates any deficiency. So this deficiency point is unique because it may appear deficient to us, but it's done what it has to do. And some things have to happen regardless of what humanity wants, regardless of what we think it has to be. We are not the ones who get to put our will in command, right? So we may think something is deficient when in reality it's an inconvenient to us, but that doesn't mean it's overall deficient. You see what I'm saying? We don't get to measure the world by how comfortable we are. Incapacity or blemish from its creator. So here it's like no deficiency, no incapacity, no blemish is upon the Creator. And that is because everything has been set as its respective role should be. And then he gives us an excellent Quran citation further to prove his point. The seven heavens and the earth and all that is therein glorify Him. And there is not a thing but glorifies His praise. But you understand not their glorification. 1744. So perfect, you see? This one really got me thinking even further because it's like we may not understand the glorification and that brought me back to the prostration point. Because they're like, oh, how does the earth and the mountains prostrate? Like, you know, stupid atheists would say. And here it's like, we may not understand how they glorify Allah, but Allah has made them in their role and whatever their role is, they have been commanded to do it in that way and Allah has set it how he wants to set it. And we, with our tiny little brains and our very fragile eyes that need glasses, don't get to determine how the worshipping, the submission is contained or expressed, right? Very cool how he brings in these citations for us that solidify the points and merely show you like, oh, that's really cool. I mean, you can tell why he was on the Supreme Council of Scholars. I mean, he's just... The way he lays it out is just perfect. He continues further. All these creatures, both dumb and vocal, living and dead, are all obedient to Allah and submissive to his universal command. So, the living and the dead. So, what I thought about the dead part was, is you know how when, the, when we were brought back to life on the resurrection, we will exit death. We will exit that stage, that, that mode. But if something is dead now, it's because it's been commanded to be dead and stay dead. So, stay alive or stay dead. Pretty cool. If you think about it in the way of a universal command. 
by the will of Allah, right? He continues, all of them absolve him of deficiencies and defects implicitly or explicitly. So absolve, so again, Allah is free from imperfection. Allah is the most perfect, right? A perceived dysfunction within the cosmos, within reality, within our dimension, is not reflective of the Creator. It can show us a sign, an essence, but we cannot then apply that to God. As God now has a defect because we have perceived something that s appears to be out of order for us or not to our ideal and likening. So I thought that was pretty cool. He continues, Whenever a sane person ponders over these creation, he recognizes that it has been created with truth and for truth, i.e. for a true reason. So, every, so this is a cool point right here. So, created with truth, for truth, a.k.a. essentially for a true reason. So everything has been created for a true reason, regardless of how we think there's a negation, a deficiencies, or a, or the respective role expression, right? Everything has been given its capacity, its term, essentially its function. So again, it's subjugation and submission, Allah's universal command, and... Everything having their own forms of glorification. So that one is it's just very powerful. So everything moving in consonance with Allah's will, fulfilling their roles. It's just totally brilliant. I mean, you can't deviate or fail in the command that Allah has given you because Allah is the controller, right? And it really is quite brilliant. He continues, that is subservient without deviation or failure from the command of its controller. So... Why is something there? It's been created for its true reason that befits it and what it's supposed to do. It's subservient, aka doing an act of worship, its form of prostration and glorification, unwillingly or willingly for Allah, and it cannot do something that Allah has not told it to do. So, another aspect of Allah having full dominion, and it cannot fail the command of Allah, because Allah is the one who is going to control it, nothing can escape the will of Allah, the vision of Allah, nothing of Allah. Like they can't, you can't just do whatever you want. Nothing can do whatever it wants. And if let's say for example, a boulder is rolling down the hill, crushes somebody. Well, that's how it's there for that reason. That doesn't then mean that that is some sort of defect that Allah didn't permit that to happen. You see what I'm saying? A lot of atheists contend to say, well, because an accident has happened to someone where they die, therefore that means Allah is uh, deficient in something, as if the world has to be cotton balls, gummy worms, and unicorns. I mean, they really forget you're living on this planet where everything is struggling and dying and being born in an endless, you know, affair of strife. Right, there's relaxation and comfort, but this is not paradise. This is earth. This is the stomping grounds of tests and trials, right? Everything is where it's supposed to be for its true reason. Then he gives uh, Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah's point here. May Allah grant him mercy. He uh, Ibn Taymiyyah contends they are subject, submissive, obedient, and compelled from several perspectives. So another cool point here was compelled. Obedient, submissive, and subjected. So submissive also implies worship, because to submit is an act of worship, right? He contends, their recognition of their dependence and dire need of him, Allah. So recognizing our dependence and real need of Allah. This comes in with humility, because if you look how fragile you are with your electricity, with, you know, needing to go to the store for a headache... You, we really are dependent upon Allah, and if we recognize that, we become more humble. If we become more humble, we'll submit more and be more willing to prostrate in prayer to Allah with sincerity, with ikhlas. So you can see everything here as really building up your iman, uh, the way in which these wonderful scholars, Taymiyyah and Fazwan, put it. It's just really clear. He further tells us there's subjugation and submission to what occurs to them of his decrees and will 
their supplication to him in their times of need. So we have being obedient, we have being submissive, and we have our supplications. And those are the forms of us recognizing the decree and will of Allah. And that also helps our imam. So here he goes further for us and explains to us what is a believer. So the mu'min, believer, submits to the command of his Lord willingly and to whatever he decrees of calamity upon him. Again, this is something very helpful. The qadar, right? The good and the bad of it. That you have to know that you are going to have calamities in life. And you, if you're a believer, that is what Allah has placed upon you. So you submit to the command of Allah willingly and say, every person gets an apportion, uh, apportionment of struggle, right? And you need to recognize it and, and bear it as best you can. It's not going to be easy. But if you really truly reflect upon it and see the perspective of it and recognize it, I believe that Allah will give you more of an ability to get out of it because you recognize it's part of your fate. Right? And to bear patience. He continues, He acts at such times according to what he has been commanded of patience and other things. So, to show you are willing is to bear patience during a calamity. So, that is a cool point. So, he submits to Allah willingly and is subject to him willingly. So, subject and submit willingly to Allah, basically. The disbeliever, on the other hand, submits to the universal commands of his Lord. The meaning of the prostration of all things, as in the verses above, is submission. So, very cool point. Prostration equals submission. So when it says, See you not to Allah prostrate whoever is in the heavens and whoever is on the earth, and the sun and the moon, and the stars and the mountains and the trees, and ad-dawab, moving creatures, beasts, etc., and many men, Quran 22.18. So, prostration means submission, right? And submission is worship. Very interesting how it all connects. Overlaps, built upon each other. So each prostrates in a manner that befits its nature and encompasses submission to the Lord. So again, all of us, everything in our reality is going to submit in a way that befits their nature. We can't forget that. So when certain atheists mock us and say, how does the sun prostrate to Allah? Well, it's going to do it in a way that encompasses its essence and its submission to Allah and in a way that befits its nature. And they could say that's a cop-out, but it's like, well, no, you just lack this ability to see any type of universal command. And you don't really care to hear about what is prostration, what is submission, what is dependence, what is subjugation. What is the decree of Allah? You kind of just want to do these jabs of like too much literalism and not looking at a more dynamic form of literalism that befits each object, creation, each beings, each entity's nature and form of expression within our reality. He contends further, the glorification of his praise is in accordance with its nature. So, the way in which everything will glorify Allah is accordance with its nature, not the way we think it should be, right? The sun isn't going to grow legs and then get on a prayer mat. That's not how it is. The atheists like to make it cartoonish and anthropomorphize the sun and the moon, whereas here, the noble scholar tells us it's in accordance in a way that befits their nature, right? It is real and not figurative. So here is a unique point here. So some, I know that they see, can be both literal and figurative, both metaphorical and literal, because it's like the sun isn't going to sprout arms and stuff and start making du'as. You know, it's going to do what it has to do in a way that's outside of the human's consciousness and perceived notions of worship, right? So it's really unique. Again, whatever Allah decrees of a calamity... We accept it, we deal with it, and the way in which we show our willingness is by being patient and other things. So again, just really valuable knowledge for us. I mean, totally valuable. And again, he notes for us that all creatures are subjected to Allah's will, and that creation is under the obligation to Allah, 
and controlled by law, and everything submits willingly or unwillingly. No creature can escape the will of Allah or his decrees or preordainments, right? And that everything is dependent on Allah, while Allah is free of need, and that we are subjected and subdued to the power, majesty of Allah, and that every event must possess a cause. So again, highly educational, really beneficial. He backs up his statements that with Quranic citations that really make you see, wow, another point, just like remember in 1744. But you understand not their glorification. So just because we want the moon to get out of prayer, man, and say, how does it glorify Allah and prostrate? No, it's in a way that befits their majesty, with that befits their nature, and accordance with its nature. So the way in which we worship is different than the way the bird does, right, essentially. Each all of us are fulfilling our roles, and we're being compelled to do what we need to do, and we were created for truth, and with truth for a true reason. And doing so shows we are subservient to the decree of Allah. So again, reading these wonderful scholars really opens your mind. Hope you learned.